Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for uh, wanting to do this. I'm doing it because I usually don't do a lot of these, um, it, but I'm doing it because I get your request. And then my first thing is I usually go, do they have, um, or my manager will go, like look, look, like the viewership, if they've got like, you know, over, I don't know if it's like 100,000 or something like that, then we'll be like, okay, that's good for like, you know, promotion and stuff like that. And I look at your account, I'm like going, uh, and at first I've been like, oh, it's another, because you get a lot of them from, from young fans and stuff like that. I'm like going, oh yeah. And then I started looking at your interviews and I'm like going, what the, f can I swear by the way? Yeah, it's fine. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Interview. And then I'm like, this is a tenacious motherfucker. And like, I'm really, it's super impressive. Um, and by the end of like scrolling through and checking out some of your interviews, I'm like going, okay, first off, we got to get you better lighting. I want to, I want to brand you. I want to get the logo. I want to, like, <laughs> yeah, thank you. you're doing, you're landing really good interviews and stuff. And so, you know, I don't know what your, what your end goal is, but, um, uh, you could definitely, you know, uh, you've got the, uh, the knack for it apparently. So thanks. Yeah. Um, so I did want to start from, was it the way that you got into SAG was being in a murder by midnight? Oh, wow. Okay. That's right. You knew that. <laughs> I forgot all that. You really, really fascinating um, uh, research stuff. Um, Mur murder by midnight. I think murder by midnight is actually, it was, I remember there was a couple of them. There were dinner theater shows um, that we did on Sunset Boulevard. Earl Bowen, who you guys might know from, uh, Terminator. Uh, he was the therapist, like the first three Terminator movies. Um, and, uh, um, and so he and his wife used to do this dinner murder mystery thing. And so I played Christina Cross, which was a, a, a murderer in drag. Um, and so we, we sang different songs from like the forties and we, then we would sit down and have parts for a meal. And then, then we, part of the story would roll out and all that. And by the end it was revealed. It was very high camp and stuff like that. It was super fun. Very first gig I got at 19. Uh, but no, that was a completely non-union experience altogether. Um, the first, I got my SAG card. Uh, well, I got became SAG eligible by doing a commercial called Roy uh, for Roy Rogers. Oh, um, okay. yeah. Originally, I thought I was going to get my SAG card because I had auditioned for a show on the Playboy Channel, and it was supposed to be like the Playboy's ver channel's version of the Twilight Zone. And I, uh, even though I was nineteen. I had a, this, I still had a low voice, um, and I was six two, and but I auditioned for the role of a sixteen year old whose whose sister's Barbie doll comes to life when she's not around, and he falls in love with the Barbie doll, and like he loses his virginity to the Barbie doll, oh. and um, yeah, it was very, it was a, it's, it was a twisted little Twilight Zone thing, but I, and it was Union though, and I thought I had two callbacks for it, and the second callback, the director's like okay, I think we can actually build the sets larger around you so that you look shorter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which seemed really exciting at the time, but I'm pretty sure when I left, the producer said, no, we can't do that. <laughs> and he's too fucking tall. So, <laughs> so my, yeah, so Roy Rogers was how I got my sack card. So would being in the Weird Al TV show be so shortly after that? <laughs> no, that, that was, um, what a weird, like, little gig to get into after that that was a friend of mine diane de rosario somehow knew weird, weird al and uh and he was taking over mtv for like a day and said uh we come uh because we were in an improv group together and so she said come out and play this play one of these characters so yeah but and that was um non-union so. <laughs> okay. what about with future force back off dude no um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about future as in well so that was Oh, but that was before my SAG card. That was a non-union thing. I, drew, and I uh, Let's see, I made, shot it all in one day um, in San Bernardino. And I so I had to drive out there, spend the night. I spent the night uh, sharing the room with the DP. Um, and uh, and then it was one day they shot out all my stuff, even though I'm the freaking hero of that movie. Um, and I, got to, I didn't get to meet any of the other actors because they were all on video screens. And uh, yeah, it was a very, I learned a lot doing that. And I got paid 60 bucks. So mm -hmm. that was First film. So what was the like first major TV series that you worked on? Um, TV series. Uh, well, I guess the first the first big one, and when I say big, like for me, it'd be like recognizable credit and all that. I've had a very kind of weird career. Um, I've never, I never like attained the, the kind of, uh, how I envisioned my, what my career would be when I moved to LA. 
is not the career I ended up having. Um, but I'm not, I don't regret it at all. I've, I've, it's been, it's been an interesting journey. TV first recognizable credit really would have been coach, um, okay. which was a big ABC. They were in the top 10 every week. And, uh, it was directed by Tony Dow from um, Leave it to Beaver. And um, I had, it's supposed to be this drama kid who comes in and it's supposed to be like from a streetcar named Desire and Marlon Brando where he comes in and it's like that Stella and he's supposed to yell her name out. I had never seen a streetcar named Desire. I had no idea that's what it was alluding to. And so I was just making up some weird party guy. Um, and it obviously didn't work when we were rehearsing. And the director said, get together. Like it was such a small part, they didn't really give a shit about me. But he's like, get together with her and work, work out the uh, that bit. And I didn't know what that meant. I was going to approach the series regular and go, could you help us me work on this bit? So, um, but they ended up cutting it anyway because they didn't, they, uh, which they do in TV, like a little stuff that's not plot specific. They yeah. just end up deleting. So I had like I had three lines that they cut from the show. So um, you see me kneel down at a fireplace. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I know you fell on the soap opera like around that same time. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, the soap operas are kind of like like little paychecks you get throughout um, your career. Um, they don't happen as much now, uh, sadly. Yeah, I think it, it was like Days of Our Lives. or I get them all confused. The names kind of run together. The longest one I did was, or the, the, more, the most gigs I ever got on a soap would, would have been um, uh, Bold and Beautiful, I think. Um, oh, no, I had a run on... Oh, I forget the name of it. Actually, I have to hold a gun and everything. Um, and then I get arrested at the end of the arc. Um, that was that was years later. I don't know. But yeah, so the soaps, because there's uh, there were three major soaps that shot around here. Um, and then like and then Passions was there for a little bit and Santa Barbara, uh, which didn't last long. And uh, yeah, so this is the kind of gig that you would get. You get a day on a soap here or there or whatever. And you make uh, you make some some money and nobody cared that you were on the soap except for, you know, certain you know, family members, but <laughs> well, like career-wise, it didn't help. Like I went into the next audition and going, you know, I just did Bold and the Beautiful and like nobody cared, so. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody I've talked to so far who's been on soap operas or at least daytime soap said that it was uh, like way more difficult to get used to. You know what? I think if you don't have um, a theater background, it might be difficult, but uh, well, no way, actually, I take that back. Yeah, it, because it's it moves very fast and they change the dialogue as they go. Plus, the other actors are no one's really verbatim on it because they have so much to learn. And it actually got crazier um, in the last uh, ten years. I haven't done a soap now in probably about six years, but the last couple of times I did it because they were losing so much um, uh, viewership uh, and the their production uh, uh, budgets were were cut way back. They were doing. They used to shoot year round and now they would shoot in like three week increments and then they'd be off for six weeks and then just three weeks. So they were like doing two or three episodes a day, which really confused like the regulars because they didn't know what scene am I doing and what episode, where in the arc is this part happening? Um, it was, it got really hard for them. But uh, for me, I guess uh, also, I guess, cause I, also, I did some uh, sitcoms. If you do sitcoms and you go to soaps, it's, I think, easier as well because of that. There's a live component um, and just moving quick on your feet. You know, it was never difficult for me. I kind of, to me, if anything, it was like a little easier because you're not waiting around in between takes. No one's being super precious. You're already lit. So that's like the theater part of it. You just walk on and you can start acting. Yeah, I think it's, and it's also because it's multi-camera. They're getting all the angles. There's no, you like, you do it once or twice and they move on. You're like going, did we get it? And of course, they got it from every single angle and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but there's a little bit of a higher pressure because they're moving so fast. But I like that, so. Okay. And uh, I would guess that, like, in terms of your early uh, TV work, that being on Boston Common would be the best experience? That would be, uh, oh, best is hard. No, no. <laughs> um, the best experiences would have been all the weird freaking indies that I did. But, the, uh, but Boston Common was, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. No, it was, um, it was. I, it was the, like a, the first time I ever got cast in a recurring role and I wanted, my whole thing was like, I wanted to become a series regular on some show that would run for three years and I'd make, and then I'd get residuals for life and I could just go off and do movies and things like that. And then that would be my career. And of course it never happened. By the time I did get a, a, a series in a car, as a cartoon, as a voiceover, the, it, the money and residuals were not the same as they were if you got a show back in the, in the 80s. It was a recurring, so I did the pilot and then 
I like bought a, at the end of the week, I'd buy like a gift or something for the producers, uh, Max Munchnik and David Cohen and the creators, producers, and um, hoping that I ingratiated myself because this is what I would do, you know, with casting people and all that kind of thing, that I ingratiated myself enough that they might have me back. Well, then they did when they came back. Um, and uh, so I was like, really like it worked. But then I'm like, oh, shit, I got to do another gift at the end of this week. <laughs> and so I'd have to keep thinking of gifts to give them. Um, and they were clever, interesting gifts about based like around college stuff, like being a student. One one week I bought them uh, all uh, boxes of uh, number two pencils because I knew that I heard in the writer's room they all use pencils. So they were number two pencils. And on it, it said, how many classes can DC take? Just trying to get my character to come back. And they ended up changing the character to my name, which was sweet. So, But I did like a 10 or 11 episodes all together. And then foolishly spent a lot of that money that I made thinking, oh, I'll get residuals when it reruns in the summer. And then they cancel it and didn't rerun it in the summer. And I never got those residuals. There's something about sitcom sets that I've never been uh, like, like super confident um, when I'm on set. Like I know my thing, but otherwise, as far as like talking to other people, I, I had that weird um, self-esteem thing that I didn't, that I didn't deserve to be where I was. So I didn't want to bother anybody for fear that they would find out and kick me off the show. Um, <laughs> which is all ir irrational, but that's like the fear of, of a young actor. But that's what I was trying to say about Boston Common is even though it was great that I did 11 episodes, and even though I got to know these people, I was scared every week that I hope they like me enough to bring me back. So I was never just enjoying that week and being in the moment for that week. Starting to get to that place where it's like, this is a job kind yeah. of thing. And it's not good to say, but it's true. And what is the case where you've been like the most starstruck by who you've worked with? Star. Oh, um, Diagnosis Murder with uh, Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. Because I grew up with him. He was like my big brother. And, um, and he was super nice. Um, even then, you know, I mean, he's like 90 something now. Um, and so then I guess he was in his 70s, but he was like vigorous and doing push ups between takes and things like that. And just super friendly. And we, I'm, I get to work with him a lot because it was took place on a plane. And um, so the, the set was literally just the capsule of this um, plane. So we'd be between takes and there was nowhere to go, but just to stand there and chat with each other until the next, uh, they're ready for the next take. Um, and so that was neat. And I, I held off for half a week before I finally gushed and said how much I, you know, I was a fan and all that. I had to do it during between one of the, the, the takes with them. So. Uh, so that would be the, uh, on a job, the most starstruck. Personally, the most starstruck would be, I met Vincent Price at a post office, and that I was starstruck. And I met Tim Curry, which would be the, the one, because uh, when, I, when I knew that I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid, um, I, w I thought I always wanted to have like Tim Curry's career. Um, and then oddly telling him that in person, I met him at the Arclay. Um, I told him that in person, and then, and he laughed. And he goes, uh, and he started talking about his career. And I realized that he wasn't satisfied with his career. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, Jesus, no matter what level you get at, you're never going to be satisfied. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, with all the TV shows that you've worked on, too, has it mostly been a positive experience for you? I would, yeah, the only times that they've, it's not necessarily been fully positive is because I wasn't secure in myself because I was um, uh, fearful of this or that and just couldn't fully relax. I had one experience where the set was just not a happy set, um, but I was old enough because like I said, my early, a lot of the, the first, what, 20 years of it, I, I think I had always had that insecure thing, but like the last... Um, Last 15 years, I've been kind of like, I don't really give a shit. Um, and so at that point, I didn't really give a shit because it was so funny. It was, uh, I can say the show, that's off the air. Um, who's the one that had Anthony LaPaglia on it? Oh, I'd have to check. You don't know, do you? I don't know either. Apparently, so I was in the makeup uh, chair and the makeup guy was going on about how um, the other actress wanted him fired. It was without a trace. Uh -huh. um, and Wanted to get him fired and all that and then Anthony Lepagas stood up but like there was everyone was like fighting each other so immediately I got the, the, the put into my ear that everybody did not like each other this was I think the last uh, season as well for them and the one of the producers is also directing this episode so they said okay you guys are up meet over on this sort of set the director's going to come in and talk about the scene so we get in costume we go there I'm sitting down at the table um, and the, the director comes in he looks like a, a very angry Santa Claus and he sits down and he looks up at us. He looks around and he's like, who do you play? And I go, I'm so-and-so, the, the, the husband. And he's like, God damn it. 
<laughs> and in that moment, I'm, I'm like, oh, and I go, did they cast the wrong actor? Because to me at that point, this is like super funny. If they cast the wrong actor, this would be really funny. And he's like, no, no, you're just you're not supposed to be in a sweater. You need to be in a suit. And I'm like, hmm, all right. And like, so he's mad about something with Ward or whatever, but like, like a completely irrational reaction. It's like, you're not shooting for another 20 minutes. I can easily go put on another outfit. But it was like, that's, that was like the ickiest set that I was on, just as far as attitude and people, the way everyone was behaving with each other. Um, but it didn't, but I was at the age where it didn't make me any, like I was still finding my job because it, yeah, I'd uh, finally gotten over being so insecure about that stuff. And so when voiceover came into play for you, did you kind of prefer that more than on camera? I love the, because uh, in voiceover, there's actually several different kinds of careers. So commercial voiceovers, I love going in and working for, you know, an hour and then getting paid a buttload of money repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> That's super nice. Um, and it's, yes, it's drawing on my acting abilities and the stuff that I studied and, and all of those years of experience. It draws on all of that, but I don't look, but it doesn't also feel like it. It, it, it just feels, it feels sort of easy um, mm -hmm. for the money that I'm getting. It's all out of whack, out of proportion, but I don't enjoy it more um, when it comes down to like, you know, what feeds your soul kind of thing. I, I've had so many different examples. So for instance, recently in July, I was doing a film in uh, Connecticut and I was, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, I'm five course. So I do union and non-union. It was a yeah. non-union film. I was getting, um, you know, I think, 3000 a week. And I was there for two weeks. I was making $6,000 on my day off. I had um, a voiceover session for three uh, commercials that I needed to go record. And they booked a studio. I went into the studio within an hour. I knocked them all out and it was like, see you later. And in that hour I made more than I was, ma I made twice as much as I was making for the two weeks that I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, like, did I enjoy myself more? No, I, I like, I, I don't mind, you know, uh, especially if it's a friend's film, I don't, I'll work for free on their film because it's, I enjoy acting with my eyes, my body, my face, all of that. Um, always far more than I do um, uh, behind a microphone. Um, I appreciate the artistry that goes into being behind a mic for, for, for gigs and things, but it's never as, I like the full on experience of being on a set and all of that. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, would like one of the first major voiceover jobs you got was being the announcer on Young Hercules. I like this is kind of like, has he done his homework? Um, <laughs> no, it got, it's really impressive that you're that you, uh, all these questions that you ask. Um, the uh, uh, would that have been? Well, definitely the, the first one that anyone would even know about. Um, okay. That was a weird one too. They it was uh, they I, I auditioned. I went into the producer's office on Paramount, and he had a tape recorder, and I basically hit record. And I'm standing over his desk and I just had to like do it. It was so weird. <laughs> and I booked it for some weird reason, but they record it in LA. They had to record it in Vancouver. So they flew me first class to Vancouver um, the next morning, did the voiceover, and then they flew me back. Oh. <laughs> like, it, was the, it was the weirdest. Thing. So, but it was the first, I mean, I, I had done a lot of other voiceover things before then, uh, like for 1-900 lines, um, some like uh, uh, promos for trailer they used to do a lot of movie trailers back then. They don't, they rarely use voice in trailers now. Um, so, but I did a lot of those, but they were for like really like C level kind of films you'd never, it would, like if you were watching a, a videotape, a videotape at home, at the beginning of the, the tape, before you got to your movie, there'd be the previews of all the other things you could rent at that store. And, but they all had these, they're all cheesy films with cheesy voiceovers. And so I did a lot of those um, okay. for a couple of companies. They pay like seventy-five dollars a pop, kind of thing. They were really, really cheap uh, stuff. Um, but yeah, so I had been basically uh, doing little voiceovers here or there throughout the '90s. I didn't get an agent until like two thousand or so, two thousand one, I think. Um, and then literally that changed everything. Within two years, I had a home studio, and uh, and I was making all my money from. I was making. I was able to pay all my bills from voiceover money. So I, I quit. I didn't have a survival job uh, starting from then. So I've only been making all of my income from acting related stuff since 2002 so for the first 15 i was like shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you get into an anime sort of early on too after that yeah you know it's interesting is that it, I, I accidentally got into it because i didn't realize i didn't even know what anime was and in, in the late 
aughts, I guess. I mean, excuse me, the, the late 90s or early aughts. Um, uh, uh, Richard Ebkar, uh, really, very nice guy, uh, was directing some uh, show. I got in it. Um, I thought it was like, I didn't know if I was doing a movie or what, but I know that the session went on and I had line after line after line. And he had me back like three days in a row. And then a year later, they called, um, they said, we're ready for season two. And I'm like, season two? And I go, I was a voice on a whole, se- like a season of a show? I didn't, because it's, it's anime, non-union. It, anime pays the least amount of money of all the voiceovers you can do. Yeah. And, um, and at the time, I had, uh, when they called back, at that point, I was just starting my home studio. I was, you know, I was going and doing movie trailers for you know, $200 a pop. And I'm like, or for little commercials and things like that. And I'm like going, I'm not going to come in for, I think at the time it was like $50 an hour or something. And I go, I'm not going to come in and do that. I'm sorry. And they were super pissed. This is before I knew who they were. But this is also before I knew about conventions. And I don't think actually there were a lot of anime conventions then. Flash forward to 2010, I'm at a convention for uh, some video games I'd done. And there's all these anime voice actors. And I'm like, how come I haven't done a lot of anime? And I'm like, oh, that's why I haven't remembered. So I reached out to people and I said, I was mistaken. I would love to come and do some anime. At that point, they raised the rates as well. So, so I really, the anime, it's kind of reverse of a lot of voice actors. Anime was one of the last things I started to get into voiceover wise. And only truly because of uh, the convention, because the other voiceover, you'll get residuals or you get paid handsomely. Anime, you don't get paid handsomely, but you could do the conventions, which just means you get to travel and you're, you get an appearance fee, you sell pictures. There's a whole other um, uh, uh, supplementary income stream from that kind of thing. And so I thought, well, then it, now it's worth it. Um, plus, you still get to act, you know, which is nice. And I've had some really fun roles in anime, so I've appreciated it. I landed uh, uh, Transformers Rescue Bots, which was the first, like... But that was my first series, and also um, I think it might have been my second time. God, maybe my first time. I can't think of any other cartoons I did before that. If I did, they were like little tiny weird projects here or there that no one cared about. So I think Transformers was my first big original animation. I ended up doing a, uh, after that, I did like uh, 10 episodes on, uh, or more, I think, on the regular show, which was so fun. Sadly, it's last year. Um, and, uh, but yeah, Rhett, Transformers Rescue Bots was, was, is the longest running or uh, uh, first run uh, Transformer show uh, cartoon. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like hundred and something episodes. And so that was kind of cool. I'm actually, I just finally booked my second series regular role on a cartoon, but um, I can't say what it is yet, mm-hmm. uh, but it's going to be big. Um, I mean, the role is something I could do in my sleep kind of thing. I don't mean that badly. It's just, it's an easy, it's an easy role, but the cartoon itself is gorgeous and I'm so excited to be a part of it. And what was your what was your experience of being on Family Guy then? That's weird. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it's part of it is loaded because of everything about who he is, and he's very very particular to the point of sometimes you kind of wish you were a mind reader because if you don't get the exact nuance that he wants, and this is for the little things. So I because I auditioned a couple times for Family Guy, and each time it was always such an odd experience. I felt like um, I felt like a, I think also. It was one of the few times I psyched myself out as well. So there was a line for a Star Wars thing spoof they were doing. And it was just one line of one char- of a meaningless character. And apparently I was the third voice actor they had in to audition for it. And it's one line. And it's like, at one point I'm like, you can give me a line reading. And he gives me a line reading and I do it. And I still don't book it. And I'm like, to this day, I have no idea what he was not getting, what he was not hearing. It was so specific what he needed. And literally three voice actors, professional voice actors, and none of us could do the one line in that cartoon. So that's so, it was always nerve wracking to go and audition for him. And the one that I ended up doing, I did get, get was that Superman line um, that uh, did pay nicely, come to think of it, for one line. But uh, yeah, so it was neat to... You know, the stupid thing, I'll tell you a little side story. That, so the stupid thing is, because I'm not up on culture. I'm not up on who's famous. Um, and I'm sitting in the waiting room for us to go in to, uh, uh, for me, because they take you in individually uh, for these littler things. Um, and I was waiting to go in, was it to record my line? It must have been not to audition, it must have been to record. But I'm sitting there and there's some other actors that are sitting in this little nice, uh, comfy waiting area. And there's this cute fucking girl and she's so cute, but she's more than beautiful. She is funny. And I'm just enjoying listening to her talking to her. And I'm like, I'm a little older. I'm also you know, in a relationship at the time. So I, I, I can't flirt. Plus, I'm not, I have no game. I've never had game. 
And I just, but I'm, damn, I wish I could have flirted with her. And at the end, I go, I go, you were very entertaining, is what I said to her as I shook her hand goodbye. And I'm in the elevator, and this other voice actor was with me. He's like, you know who that was, do you? Don't you? And I'm like, no, it's, it's Mila Kunis. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you're very entertaining. <laughs> wow. Not only do I not have game, I'm kind of an idiot, so. <laughs> Are you friends with, like, a lot of major... Uh voice actors too not at all oh major voice actors different um <laughs> <laughs> as you say on camera actors unfortunately no um or i'd be guest starring uh, more often though i've changed my whole on camera pr- approach these days i'm kind of more like i just want to do like weird weird characters so i grew my hair long and i'm like either you use this or you can't use this but i'm not being your your middle-aged white lawyer guy anymore i got tired of that and plus there's plenty of them uh, but as far as voice actor wise, it's so funny. It's like, what is a big voice actor? I, yes, I guess I'm friends with, with, I guess what people would be considered to be voice, big voice actors. I don't consider myself to be a big voice actor, but then I go to a convention. People seem to consider me to be a big voice actor. It's all relative. You know, yeah. I'm still looking for my next job. Um, we're always looking for our next job. Transformers rescue bots. Uh, we had a really amazing cast and also on there was, um, LeVar Burton yeah. and, uh, one day, uh, we're all waiting to go in. Um, it was so fun because we used to all record together uh, for a while there before we got unruly. Um, and, but one day I was talking about a convention in this, and, and I mentioned something about the hustle of it. And, like, and then I looked at him and I go, it must be nice to be a place where you can just say yes or no to things. And he's like, and he's like, he's like baby, I have to hustle. He goes, the hustle never stops. And, uh, and it, was, it was good to hear it from somebody in the room I was working with, you know. Yeah. Is a uh, uh, good reminder, and then there's a there's a documentary on um, Joan Rivers. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a Joan Rivers documentary that any everybody should watch because it really captures what it is to be to have a long career in this business. She's been famous since the '60s, yeah. and you follow this documentary and you see it. In order for her to maintain her lifestyle, she's still up until she died, of course, but she still had to hustle all the time to get the next gig and get the next gig and get the next gig. Her whole her whole life is was always running towards the next thing and it's exhausting unless of course it's just second nature for you then and that's the, that's what it is to be an actor in this business no matter how famous or big name you think somebody is everybody's always hustling uh would your first like really major video game role be a uh, raven in the tekken series i don't know what's big and what isn't big it's, it's other people let me know that i always considered my first big game to be um uh resident evil on uh, relic chronicles yeah, um, but that was the one that when I told people what I was doing afterwards, I, mean, I had a poker group at the time, and I mentioned it, and and uh, the younger ones were like, "Fuck!" Excuse me. Oh, I can swear. They were like, "Fuck!" You could be Albert Wesker. That's huge. I'm like, "Is it really? Is it huge?" I don't play video games, so I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's when I realized, and then I just got lucky. Literally a year later, I booked Mass Effect, uh, Mass Effect Two, playing Legion. And um, so l- within a you know, two-year period there, I was in two major franchises. And uh, that, I think that's kind of uh, voiceover-wise propelled me to this other kind of level. Uh, again, perception level. It's you're always just, when I'm not working, I'm not working. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, like two major games that I, or game series that I played a lot growing up that you were a part of, if you remember being in uh, the Dot Hack or Xeno Saga series. Mm, yeah. I got a lot of work early on. I, I hooked up with this studio called um, Cup of Tea Productions in yep. the Valley. And uh, those ladies are great. And so I got a lot of uh, these, I guess they're JRPGs. I'm learning, I'm learning. Yep. Um, <laughs> and I, I did a lot of those. And the thing was, is I, I, I regret this, that when I started doing them, uh, I looked at them as like, uh, I was just another quick thing to make some money. Like I didn't really, um, especially because we're trying to match the Japanese voices. And a lot of times the performance were just kind of stilted because uh, I don't speak Japanese, but the sound of it was very stilted. So I, f- I felt like my performances were stilted and I never put the extra effort to go, hey, can we soften this or make this a little more naturalistic or anything, you know, that kind of thing. Um, also, I would say the producers, um, a lot of times you have the Japanese producer there or piped in yeah. and they're, re- they're reticent to that kind of change as well. They kind of want the English carbon copy of what was in the Japanese. And now, thank goodness, the, the, that's changing in the industry and they, they realize that 
what's what works you know performance wise for a japanese audience doesn't necessarily work as well for an american audience that there's certain things that we can do to make these characters more accessible uh, to the english ear and um so there's a lot more of that now so for instance when i got to do jojo's bizarre adventure the uh playing kira i really wanted to because I, I i wanted to do the role the minute i saw it. i had no idea he was through the whole thing i just saw the one scene the first scene that you introduces him and i'm like i, I gotta do this character um and when i got it i'm like you know they played it and i could hear the other guy's voice who apparently does a wonderful job as well but it's it's still got a little bit of that anime performance and so i wanted to go for more of this natural thing i did one pass at it and the director goes no 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 just bring him up a little more louder more present and the the um, uh owner of the company not owner um, but the lady who runs that studio was in on that session she liked to she, sometimes she'll do that to make sure that we establish the voice and she went no no that's good you let him stay with that and so i was able to keep you know what i was doing i was so appreciative of that um, that's got to be one of my that was my, my favorite anime character uh, up until recently so all right yeah well who is your uh like, I, mean, I tend to spiral so forgive me <laughs> okay no, <it's> okay <laughs> Well, who is your um, most favorite, like, recent anime character, then, that you've played? My most favorite recent thing, if you're asking. Not that I set you up for it. Um, no, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Shaman King. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wooden Sword Rio. It's on Netflix. Um, and that character is so fun to do. Um, I'm doing, basically, a bad Elvis. I'm, mm -hmm. like, I, I figure he's this 16-year-old who, or I guess he's 17. I forget how old he is. Um, but, like, I, you know, I figured, obviously, he dresses like Elvis, so he loves a certain Elvis aspects and try to work some of that into it. But of course, I'm not an imp impressionist. I'm a horrible impressionist. So um, it works good for the voice then. <laughs> also, yeah, it's, just, just, it's a funny. I was going to guess it was either him or uh, your role in Welcome to Demon School. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, you know, prior to Shaman King, it would have been that. It would have been my second favorite. Yes, doing. I've, been, I've, I've had fun doing that. I mean, I feel I'm, I'm also... That's way more in my wheelhouse of the kind of characters that I get. Like even my on-camera characters, that's more in the wheelhouse of the kind of characters I get. Um, so, uh, uh, but that sh that show is really lovely and, and fun to do. So, Shaman King was just—I'd never done a voice like that before, and um, and just his attitude, the fact that I get to see a baby, um, <laughs> it's like that makes me happy. So, um, okay. yeah. And uh, this is a darker anime role, but uh, serious the Edgar. Yeah, that was it. Was fun to do. We we moved through it quickly. So the thing sometimes it's like I'll I'll do a thing. I'll do like three or four episodes, but we'll do it all in one session, and then that's it. And I never get to revisit it again. So I don't I don't necessarily uh, uh, get to remember much. I did one recently that we did like I think one or two sessions. Um, it's only two th two or three episodes, and it's called uh, How Not to Summon a Demon Lord. Yeah, and I'm playing this this very uh, pious priest who turns out to be have a sex dungeon. Um, mm -hmm. So that stayed with me because of the sex dungeon. Uh, like that show is kind of funny. Yeah, that was a quick um because he's just like a, a small arc in that thing. Has there been a case where you've uh, had to get like really emotionally involved with anime so far? You know, it's such a technical process. So like I did Persona Five, and I have a thing at the end of that where I'm uh, I have a mea culpa and. Um, I mean, he's a creep, he's a horrible character, but I, the mea culpa is like a fairly long little monologue. And at the end of that, I mean, I teared up in the studio and that was one of the few times that I had the kind of experience, but with anime, it's just so limited. There's a new, th or it's fairly new called um, Rhythmo Band. Yeah. And that really neat process where uh, Shaman King is done that way. And Rio in a couple episodes has like these minute long monologues. And if we were doing it the old way, um, that would have taken us, you know, several hours to get through because we'd have to do it in little chunks and each thing to, uh, to to make sure that it was timing out. On Rhythmo Band, it's like I just ran through for the minute and a half. They'd go back over, clean it up a little bit. Maybe we do a second take. Maybe we just grab a certain section and then we move on to the next one. And like it goes so much quicker. And that gives you more of a chance to performance wise get more lost in it and have more of an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, but as far as like just general feel, I mean, Kira from because I, I did a lot of episodes I and he had wonderful monologues so I um, I have an affinity for that whole experience um, that was my first big anime role so always appreciative of it 
So, mm -hmm. and I know now for playing lots of creepy people. So, in terms of video games, like I can ask that same question with video games too. Uh, outside of Wesker, who do you think you have the most affinity with? Who's to say I have an affinity for Wesker? He's a <laughs> <creep>. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, I mean, uh, Legion's just my voice, but um, uh, but it, it's such a well written. Um, uh, uh, game everything about that is so beautifully written and the fan base uh, it's a very smart uh, dedicated fan base i have to go back to my website and go and find like the sample and go oh i like doing that guy um yeah but nothing nothing really uh sticks out oh well there's one right now but i can't tell you what it is it's going to be big though uh next year mm -hmm. um and i'm actually doing uh mocap for it. i don't get to do a lot of mocap so um, I think the first mo full mocap game I did, nobody gave a shit about. I mean, they loved the game, but they didn't give a shit about the story. And yeah. that was NBA 2K14. And oh. it's like, they play for the sports, they don't story mode. And I'm like, that's, I like, we, I, I spent a week and I like, I did like pages and pages of dialogue. Um, and, uh, uh, but it was full mocap as well. They, they said they were going to make the character look like me. And so I did the photo shoot and all of that. And then I finally saw the game and a cut scene. And I'm like going, I look like a melting Bill Pullman. That is not how I look. <laughs> so you, it's like they did two renders on me and then 10 for all the basketball players. But, <laughs> but it was a great experience. We did that in San Francisco. That was a full mocap thing. But right now I'm doing a full mocap thing for this character that oh, I can't say anything about it, can I? All I know is that there'll be fan art later and then, then people might cosplay. So. Okay. <laughs> And I know with Fire Emblem that you got to play uh, like four different characters. Yeah, I did. That to me reminds me of like soap operas where <laughs> like I'm both people. I've been like five different people on that show over the years. I've been like three different doctors, two priests. Um, <laughs> so Fire Emblem is a little like that because there's so many different iterations of it. Um, yeah, even I forget all that I've done. Um, I think that's the one that's got, I call him the Gilf, the, gram the, the grandpa I'd like to find. Oh, I'm forgetting the name, but there's like an old character. Apparently, a lot of uh, girls swoon over because they marry him. He's, he's an old man. Um, then there's the bald-headed uh, monk. And I, I can't remember these character names. Yeah, and I guess some other characters. You know better than me, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> what 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 made you start doing these interviews? If you don't mind me asking. Um, I met I met Eric Vale like virtually through a convention like April of last year. And then I just started to uh, think that I wanted to, um, you know, ask, try to reach out to people and ask them things that I know they had never been asked before. And uh, it started with music people. Like I did Billy Steinberg, who he's just, he, he wrote a, Like a Virgin and So Emotional and um, right. songs like that. And then, yeah, it led to like Rosanna Arquette and Leah Thompson. And yeah, it's, just it's just amazing that like you asked and you shall receive. It's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, good for you, man. I think that's fantastic. Thanks. But yeah, I was going to ask next. Uh, I know a, a really recent popular series um, that you got to be a part of, uh, uh, Akadama Drive. Yeah. Oh, he was fun too. Badass. He was a badass. I actually ended up getting COVID in between episodes. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they had that we had to go back and do a pickup on, on one of the episodes because my voice was still out of it um but uh yeah i'll, I'll always remember that because of covid um yeah yeah no he was it, that was a fun it was it's fun to do like a badass character and she really let me do the badass voice too so um yeah that was nice, nice. what was your experience getting involved with uh, playing x drake in one piece that was a result of when I said that um, I went to these cons and I'm like, what are they, all these anime people? What is this about? Um, and then when I decided I wanted to get to do more anime, I reached out to some people that I knew here, Elizabeth, uh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. She was directing some stuff. I reached out to her and to Wendy um, and a couple others and to Bang Zoom. And Bang Zoom, it's like I got, uh, she remembered me from years ago. I guess I did a little thing there. So I was really grateful for that. Um, and she's just started bringing me in first on small things and then larger stuff. But the, uh, I was at a con and, um, um, oh, I'm going to blank on his name right now. I'm really horrible with the names. People even I've known for years, I blank on names. Anyway, the, he's a voice actor, but he directs a lot of games uh, or directs a lot of uh, anime. And he used to be at Funimation. 
So I'm at a convention in Detroit and he was down at the bar. So I, uh, and I'd never met him before. So I got introduced to him and then I immediately told him, I go, you know, I am, I know Funimation only at the time, uh, COVID changed everything, but at the time Funimation only worked with uh, actors if you were in Texas. And I said, you know, if you could get me like a large role in one of the animes, I'd, you know, fly myself out to Texas and, you know, put myself up for a week to, to knock out like a nice big role, you know, cause I knew that that would help with convention stuff. And, um, and he's like, I'm so glad you mentioned that because there's these, tri- I guess the trio or five, what do they call them? You would know what it is. The, or somebody out there does the, um, uh, this group of pirates that he's, uh, extra is part of. And he goes, oh, I want to cast them with, uh, with, uh, well-known voice actors. And he goes, so, uh, I'll put you in as one of those guys. And I'm like, fantastic. So then it turned out, I didn't have to go to Texas that we could do it over at Todd Habercorn. So thing, the few episodes that he has. Um, and they said there'll be more when they get to his arc. He's got a huge arc, but it could be five years from now. <laughs> <laughs> They're so far behind on the, 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 the manga. So yeah, so that's how that happened. Um, so super grateful to him. The guy whose name I know that I just don't know at the moment. <laughs> it's okay. I see, yeah. Anyway. So he, uh, he can, oh, Borderlands. He put me in Borderlands recently. Um, love something and something. Um, and I'm a, I have a storyline. I'm this... Uh, gunslinger type guy who they can't remember anything bill billy briggs uh i don't even know if i'm, I'm a, he's actually even uncertain of his own name and then through this through following him you the story unwinds and you it's actually a really sad story but it starts off very funny um and uh, so it's happy to be putting that that was a voice that i hadn't done before in a game so i was appreciative what is the case where you've had to alter your voice the most for a role so far oh uh well, I mean, there's, there's ones where you have to be like a creature, you know, and you blow out your voice for that one session and then never visit it again, thank God. Well, there is Persona 4 dancing all night. I'll yeah. never get a character like that again, nor should I ever do that again. Um, but, but you know what? It was written the way it was, and it's like either we're doing it or we're not doing it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do the voice right now. Okay. But <laughs> you can go to my website. I'll look up Persona 4 and you can watch the video. <laughs> and uh, how about with like the case where you've had to do the most voices, like incidental stuff in one in one series or game or something? Yeah, it's um, the only one that comes to mind. And it's not like, here's the thing, because I'm not like a man of a thousand voices. I sometimes consider myself, like I'm lucky that I have a career. Um, I think I have like eight voices in me and then everything else I'm like just trying to, barely get by on and uh but it was uh it was a star wars game night oh, yeah, yeah. old republic yeah i think that's what it was yeah and it it was actually it was um it was a while ago but i came in and it was literally they had a binder full i mean it was this thick of a binder of of, of voice files of incidental characters so for four hours they go go to page 238 and like here's this bender that you're going to speak these lines for then page 320 there's this so, I mean, I did a whole bunch. I, I found a friend of mine found a lot of what I had done in the game and sent me the voice files, uh, the video files. And so I co- put a compilation together on my, on my website of it just because I'm like, I'm in Star Wars. And that was really exciting to, to, to see. Put the music, once I put the music to it, I'm like, oh, I'm in, the, I'm in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the most voices. It would have been more voices, but I had gotten in trouble um, for some pop political stuff before that, like the year or two before that. And the director was Canadian, but as we were doing it, she, she realized somehow the fact I had done Geico commercials came up and then she goes, you know, there was the guy, the Geico commercial guy who got in trouble with the tea party. I'm like, oh yeah, that's me. And she's like, oh, hold the phone. And then like the whole session stopped. And for literally 45 minutes, we just talked about all of that experience. Um, then it was like, we had 10 minutes left. And she's like, okay, maybe just wrap off one more character and we're done. <laughs> So it would have been more characters, but she wanted to hear all the, the, the background on um, how that controversy like rolled out. So, yeah. which also so quaint now that we've had, uh, now that we've been through the Trump experience. Some of your on, on camera stuff in terms of um, real recent TV series that you've been a part of, what's been the most uh, memorable, like NCIS and Workaholics and. Like, so two years ago, I, um, my age. It was just getting me like like less auditions and bad auditions, and I, I tried to look for another agent, and no, I couldn't get other agents, uh, bigger agencies that I was trying to get with. Um, and then the last audition he got me was like to be uh, Michael. Uh, oh shit! That 
lawyer, actually, it's a Trump thing. The lawyer for Trump, it was a reenactment thing. Michael mm-hmm. Cohen. And I'm like, well, number one, I don't look like Michael Cohen. Uh, number two, I'm not shaving my goatee. And number three, it's a reenactment thing. I don't need to act that, like, I'm not that hard up to act. Um, I mean, I, I want to act, but act in good things. I don't want to act in, like, if I was 25, yes, I'll take anything. I want to act. I just want to keep acting, get as much credits and all of that. But, you know, once you pass 50, you're like, no, fuck this. It's like, if it's not something interesting or good, I don't want to do it. I don't need to be on a set. Um, and uh, so I had a big falling out with my agent. And I called uh, this casting lady who uh, uh, that I knew for years ago she was casting. And she and that was part of a boutique agency. And it was a small agency. And I knew that it was uh, going to be that. And I said, listen, this is the kind of, of career I think I want now. I just want this is going to answer your question, by the way. I go, this is the kind of career I think I want. I just want... I go, the most fun that I have had in the last 10 years have been these little indie films I've done in Houston and Philadelphia where I'm getting paid SAG modified, low budget, things like that. But I'm playing the lead or I'm playing the murderer or I'm playing some really weird character. And I go, that's the most fun that I've had as an actor in the last 10 years. And those are the things that I want to be doing. And I go, sometimes, even if it's like, it may pay just $100 and it works one day. And I go, and that will still be your commission. I guarantee you'll always get $100 <laughs> commission from me. Um, but would you be willing to submit me on that stuff? And she's like, absolutely. And she goes, and if you want to do that, she's like, uh, have you thought about maybe changing your look? Because you look very actory. And I'm like, change my look. I, I, I do. And, and, she's, and I go, she's like, you, she's, you grow your hair out a little bit. And I'm like, I'm going to grow my hair out. <laughs> I've always wanted long hair. Since I was 25, I've wanted to have long hair. So I've never been able to be me. And so now, finally, goatee, long hair. This is how it's going. If you can cast me, great. If you can't, whatever. It took me a year to grow it. And then last December, I started submitting. and just started booking things. I've done like four films since then. And I'm like, that's more than I would get if I was the short-haired, you know, uh, white guy lawyer or whatever. Because everybody goes after that stuff. And... Um, so yeah, so I'm uh, so the, the the most memorable have been these little indie films that I've done are all, all over the place, uh, mm-hmm. and they may be. And again, this is weird. I mean, they may be shitty movies. You know, you may watch them and go, "That's a horrible film," and I go, "But I know that I'm good at it, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that I had fun." Doing it. So it's all I ever wanted to do was to have fun in my life. I was going to bring this up earlier. I couldn't find any info on it, but uh, what was King's Pawn, a TV movie? Oh yeah, that was a. Um, uh, it was a, it was an independent, uh, sh- uh, pilot that they were doing for a, for a sitcom. Um, and Glenn Moore shower, who you would know, cause he's in everything. Um, he's in every big movie as like the, some military guy. Um, it was, uh, him and it was, oh, I forget his name. He Pat Joe, it's on the tip of my tongue. I told you I'm horrible with names. He just passed away too, uh, several years ago. Oh, he was the, uh, the uncle. Yes. Yes. Such a sweet guy. I had so much fun working with them. And then, the, and then I was basically his son-in-law, the white son-in-law, who was annoying uh, and all of that. And his daughter was played by the executive assistant of the guy who was funding the pilot. So oh. she was not, not the best actress. Um, she's a sweet lady, but, but she was like... Um, and they had a, this veteran director directing the pilot. And I remember he came up to me the day that we were filming and he goes... First, because he hadn't been there through the rehearsals that we'd been rehearsing on our own, and then he came in for the last three days. And so we're at lunch, and he comes over to me, and he's like, these are weird fucking people. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, even he didn't understand what this, this, this whole deal was. And I'm like, it's interesting. And he's like, yes. He's like, listen, in your scenes with her, make her alive. And I'm like, huh? And he's like, do something. Kiss her. Slap her butt. Do something. Make her react. <laughs> I'm like, I'll, I'll do what I can. And, uh, he didn't say slap her butt. He said something. I can't remember what it was, but it was like, but basically like get her to be a little more alive because it was a sitcom. Um, and yeah, so we did the sitcom and, uh, the pilot and of course it never went anywhere. Um, and, and that was it. And they were, the people that were behind it were, they, they were an odd, odd group of people. Um, they had money though. So um, yeah. But I got to, for a week, I felt like I was on a pilot, but I never considered it really being a pilot, so. Okay. What about with uh, Emma's Wish? Hmm. You're going way back. Um, you just really want me to relive my mediocrity. Uh, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> Emma's Wish was a, a movie of the week, um, and I played a carny, and 
I'm still in the film, but they cut the scene the way down, but I was able to get the dailies back. It was back in the day. So if you made friends with somebody on set, you get the dailies. So I got the dailies, was able to edit my own version of that scene um, and make my, make me even more evil in it. Um, but yeah, it's supposed to be like a, a flashback scene at the beginning of the movie where this girl, I'm supposedly this magical carny guy. Um, that was actually kind of considering my look at the time was a, a unique um, character. God, that was like 98 or something, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I had a mustache in that. I'm sorry, I just I, I didn't realize. I thought that I didn't start growing my goatee until until this century. Yeah, the things that I'm excited about right now. There's two big things, and one I'm in the middle of doing uh, mocap stuff. Um, I've actually worked on it. I, I'm amazed at how much I've worked on it because the role is. Um, it's it's not a huge role, but it's it's an important. Or I guess I could say this, yeah, because we don't know anything else that I've said about it. Um, so I guess if there's bosses, I'm the. Hang on, hang on. Let me do, do, do the math on this. For me, he's got to get him, and after him, oh yeah. So technically, you think I'm the second to the last boss, but I'm actually the third to the last boss because there's a twist. But that's all I'm just gonna say because you don't know anything else about it. So I haven't broken any NDA. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I, I started working on it at the beginning of this year and I, I, I go back next month and do some work on it. And then in January, I do some work on it. So I don't think it's going to come out until either the end of next year or maybe even the beginning of, uh, 2023. Um, but when it, no, actually they move pretty quick. It may come out in next year. Um, but it'll be big. It'll be fun. All right. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing, the cartoon, uh, is, uh, we start recording in January so that should hit, um, it's a, it'll be on one of the main, main streaming platforms. Um, and that'll be, that'll probably start airing um, in the summer. So and that'll be, that's a really a cool one for uh, not really young kids. Transformers is for really young kids. This one is, I think, aged um, like, like from 10 to like early teens kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and is there, oh, I got a film coming out called, uh, I have two films coming out. They're both, Titled similar. One is um, A Stepmother's Secret. Um, and uh, that's coming, that should be coming out on Lifetime, I think, probably in the next uh, couple months. And then also, probably in March or April of next year, Secrets by the Seashore comes out. And that one I, I had a blast doing. Um, and uh, yeah, both with my long hair. So those are two of the things that, um, that I got to do recently. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, I don't think people who watch your interviews are really into Lifetime films. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, my final question is always asking, what do you want your legacy to be? Legacy is a lie. No, um, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. And I'm actually, I, I'm, I know I'm joking, but I'm not because uh, this all ends. Um, this, the human race will end eventually. This planet will end. The sun is going to die. This is all, uh, every, there, nothing goes forever or, or it does in a different form. Um, and so when people talk about legacy, you think about it like what's someone's legacy from you know, 1412? You know, it's doubtful it's around anymore. So, and it's also a weird thing. It's like, I want to make sure you have to deal with my shit once I'm gone. You know, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, everyone be free to start your own, live your legacy and that's it. And then when you're dead, let it end. Um, I think it's, it's more about, you know, day to day living in the moment and being, you know, kind to yourself and being kind to the people that you meet. And, um, uh, cause no one knows why any of this is happening. Why it's all a fluke, uh, or it's not, but regardless, we don't understand it. Um, everyone's just kind of making it up as they go. So I think if you can at least leave people, you know, with, good feelings as opposed to negative ones, that that is the legacy and that's an in the moment legacy. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want. But as far as career, career wise, I'm, if you get enjoyment out of things that I'm a part of, that's fantastic. I'm just an actor, you know, having my fun. And if it translates to you enjoying it, then that's freaking great. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks. I'm glad that we got to do this. Yay. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm again, I think, what you're doing is fantastic. Um, get yourself a logo um, <laughs> and, um, and, and promote yourself some more. You've got like already a nice library of interviews. You're doing great. Best of luck to you. And it's really nice meeting you and um, very, very impressive what you've done so far. Thanks. Yeah, it's already it's surprising too because um, 
I've already had, like, there's a kid that has autism named Sebastian who has, like, reached out to me, and he's inspired by what I'm doing, and he started interviewing voice actors, too, and it's something I would have never oh. you know, thought of. We all affect each other. Yeah. That's the leg. We say about legacy after you're gone it's like no it's more like in the moment now how we help each other i think that's far more important and so i think that's fantastic so mm -hmm. very cool i'll be sure to send it to you of course once i have it up too absolutely please do so lovely meeting you man yeah you too you have a good night <laughs> you too bye bye, -bye.